Hello, everyone. Um, welcome, I think. Oh, sorry, I'm a bit short, so I'll stand on my tippy toes <laughs> and also try to be seen by the people that are on Teams. I have to start by saying off that this session will be recorded. Um, so this is the first time we're also trying to do a, a live event here in London in Angel and also on Teams. So hopefully everything goes smoothly. People on Teams, um, if something goes wrong, please write in the chat and we have some people here that can uh, hopefully help out. Uh, but first of all, welcome. Welcome to everyone that's come in person and everyone that's joined us online. Um, my name is Amber. I'm the marketing manager at Fedragoni UK, and I've had the pleasure of working on this project, Fedragoni 365, since the very beginning when we first started working with it in um, 2017. And this is the first time we really have a talk where we can really go in the behind the scenes of the project, talk about, um, you know, the, the process, the print partners more. So it's amazing to have um, so many people tuned in to really hear what we have to say about it. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, which I'm hoping is is, is none of you, but uh, Fender Grinning 365 is an annual calendar, but really it's more of a, a book, um, which is all about collaborations with designers, with print partners, uh, where each designer um, or agency or um, or freelancer or artist interprets a day of the year and it's all put together into one beautiful publication. Um, in terms of what we're going to be speaking about, I'm here with Danny McNeil, who is one of the founders from TM, and uh, he's going to be talking about the previous editions um, and a little bit about this one as well and the behind the scenes of uh, processes and ways of working. Then we'll move on to uh, Paul Regan from Effie Berman, who's the print partner that we worked with this year. They're a London-based printer and they talk about their capabilities and uh, the various processes that they can do. And then we'll hand over to a uh, creative coder and designer, Oswin Tickler, who designed a very special date for the 2024 edition, which is the 29th of February, because next year it's 366 as it's a leap year. And um, and the uh, software that he has developed called HP Spark, which he used to create his design. Um, and then lastly, we have someone from HP, which was another print partner we had this year, tuning in um, from abroad. So we'll have him um, on the screen on Teams, um, sharing about the massive amount of uh, of creative um, creative processes that you can do with HP and all the different technologies that they have. Um, and then at the very end, we'll have a little Q&A. So for anybody in person, you can um, ask any questions. And if anyone online would like to ask questions, just write it in the chat and we'll try to answer it. Um, and then, yeah, without further ado, we'll, we'll have a little you. start. Um, and thanks for being here again. Hi everyone, I'm Danny. I'm the creative director of TM. We're a design agency just down the road in Farringdon, um, around the corner from Fedragoni, which is really quite handy for us for lots of reasons. Um, and I'm obviously going to talk you through 365, both this year and historic editions of 365. Um, you're right. I think you're a bit taller than me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you too. Sorry. <laughs> But I just wanted to give you a sense of um, the work we do that isn't 365, just, just to put it in context. One of the criticisms we give ourselves sometimes, I think a lot of people think we're the 365 agency, but we do do other projects. Um, and here's a kind of smattering of designs for different clients. We work a lot with architects. So we've worked recently with Michaelis Boyd and we've worked as well with Wilkinson Air on websites and digital projects for them. Um, we also work with art fairs quite often. Um, there's a variety um, that, we've, that we've worked with, London Craft Week being, being one of those as an identity presented here. Um, and we work with lots of material manufacturers as well. So Mylands are a very historic paint manufacturer that um, here in London and we rebranded them and we worked on a new strategy for them um, a couple of years ago. And that's sort of, we're sort of seeing the fruits of our labours with that at the moment. It's all out there in the, in the world. You can buy their paint with our packaging on it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that gives you a kind of very broad sense of some of the work we do. Um, but in 2017, we received the brief to design the annual Fedragoni UK calendar. And this was a project that already existed. Um, and Fedragoni would ask different design agencies to um, 
effectively design a calendar a desk diary that you could write in and you could um you know treat it in a very traditional way um these are always beautiful and sort of using lots of lovely print and finishing techniques but when we kind of got the brief we thought is there another way of looking at this is a desk calendar still as relevant as it as it might have been um you know 10 20 years ago i use my phone for this purpose now so the question we posed was is the calendar still relevant or could it be an annual project that celebrates the best in creativity um, and what that meant practically was that 365 creatives were going to contribute to this project we wanted to offer a page to people to to, to collaborate with us on that um, and really the challenge was set for us you know how are we are we going to manage to gather together gather 365 designers um it was no mean feat at all and it's sort of quite a scary prospect but if we look back now like this is you know, the seventh year these are the last six we haven't managed to photograph this with the the final one at the top yet but that will come um the very first edition 2018 was this beautifully simple one um entirely black um printed in one color throughout just silver ink um, and on the cover there was two foils that were overlaid um, but I think what was lovely about this one was how how reductive it was and how it was all about this idea of collaboration of bringing a community of designers together of celebrating individual talents and individual designs and it was you know it was this feat of production in terms of getting all of these designers together and sort of involving them in the project and keeping everyone on a timeline and making sure they deliver their artwork um, when we need it. So it was a kind of project management job as well as um, a creative job. Um, and we were so pleased with the outcome and the designers that submitted. I mean, this is Harry Pierce, I think, on the left, on the right from Pentagram. Um, we had Spin in it. We had all sorts of design agencies involved. So it was fantastic to get you know, all sorts of names involved in the project. Um, we always hold an event and we've always, that's sort of historic thing that we've always done to do with the project. Um, this was the invite for that, playing with the same sort of design motifs that we had on the cover of the book, two foils overlaid one on top of the other. Um, and then we came up with this idea of hanging every single design on the wall, which we've done every year since. And we kind of regret woefully that we ever had that idea because it's a pain to do. But we have people that help. These are two ex-employees. They died after this event so <laughs> um but yeah we sort of painstakingly hang hang on the wall we work out a way of doing it we have a number of people that help on the day and we make it happen and then the end result is this wonderful celebration and again we didn't know if this was going to work if we were going to be successful but the first year we were in the protein gallery which is a capacity of like 250 people and i think 450 came across the evening so it was fantastic to achieve that um, little did we know in this shot we've worked out this is Ade from F.E. Berman that's just sort of tucked away and hidden in there which is quite nice because he worked on it this year seven years later um, then 2019 um, the challenge was you know what do we do next with this um, and we thought we've done black so let's do white that was the natural thing to do and given the world that Fedragoni are in like white paper is such a big part of what they manufacture it seemed like a great opportunity to put that in designers hands and, and give them the opportunity to work with it so this became a sort of compendium of white papers and a kind of ode to, to white white finishing it's white foil it's blind embossing lots of finishing techniques that are, are set to kind of be quite subtle and you know uh, let the paper do a lot of the talking and one of the you know we didn't really see this until we started producing dummies how all the coloured paper all, all the whites effectively have different colours in them like some are more mauve some are more yellow some are cream there's you know but yet these are all white papers and they're all sold as white paper but you start seeing the variations when you group them together like this everyone got a spread this year which I think we thought was a great idea and then the sales team from Fedragoni told us it wasn't a good idea because it's really heavy to carry and you don't want to put more than one in your bag otherwise it was very expensive that year <laughs> yeah practical things um the invite was a bookmark that was also exactly the same width as the spine which is seen here which is a really nice little touch that's sam he still works for us uh, <laughs> uh doesn't look like he's having much fun though we tried different things this was like removable spray mount i mean god it's yeah boring really um but protein gallery again great night everyone there seeing the work on the wall all of these white spreads um 2020 this was a little moment of panic when we realized that it was a leap year so the, the name 365 wasn't going to work anymore so we quickly reverted to 366 um 
and the paper that was used is Woodstock. It's an 80% recycled paper um, and there's 16 different colours in it. So it's a beautiful kind of spectrum of, of colours that you can that you can um, work with from that product. Um, for the book itself, Woodstock only went up to like a 285 gram sheet. So we came up with this sort of innovative cover that wraps back on itself. So it kind of bulks out without adding lots of cost to the production of the job. There's no duplexing going on, but it kind of the weight of it holds itself up a bit. Um, and you can just see the really lovely detail of the rainbow of colours that runs through uh, the interior of the book here. The printer we worked with for this year was Empress, and they can print white ink lithographically. So we wanted to use that and they wanted to show that off within the production. So that's what you can see here, sort of um, 10 overlaid with um, in white with black text. And given that it was the first leap year we contend with, we suddenly realised, yeah, we have to do a 29th of February as well. And we did that as a tip-in and we commissioned Super Mundane to do that. And it was a foiled tip-in, so holographic foil on a white sheet just to stand out against all the coloured pages, which was a really lovely touch. And other touches that we made, this is Amber's design, actually, that you can just see cropping to the top, which is, I didn't even realise I put in there, but I had. Um, and uh, there's with the stitching in this book, alternates between white and black that's what we were printing as well so we wanted just to you know play around with what was possible uh, within the confines of a, of a, a section same book uh this was the launch party um and we had these podiums set up with little um with, with all, the, all the different books displayed on the relevant color podium and made our lives a bit easier by hanging full-size B1 sheets rather than having individual paper so that made life a bit quicker we also launched in Manchester this year as well 2021 was the first year that we did a digital book and um, this was printed with Rico um, on a dry toner press. Uh, it's different technology in terms of how the ink works and how, how the sort of end results come out, but they also have a very a vivid set of colours that you can employ. So you can have a, a neon yellow or a, a neon green to underpin um, the, the the full colour print. And we wanted to use code again in a similar way to, to what we did this year, not quite the same thing, but overlay different gradient meshes one on top of the other so that we create lots of variations of colour that you wouldn't have dreamt up originally, that you wouldn't have expected originally. Um, so these are the covers in production. We also used a GSK sheet, which is um, a trace sheet that Fedragoni do, and we overprinted that with white ink, which is another thing you can do. And because um, this book was entirely um, assembled gener uh, with code, with algorithms, we didn't give people specific dates to work on this year. It was a number they were given. So in this case, Charlie Smith Design got the 26th, uh, got, got the 20th of April, but actually they got the, 20, the number 26. So to avoid people maybe doing lots of similar things. They didn't have the the date to work with and they might have used the date as their inspiration and lots of people might have ended up with the same things. We gave people seed words here. So in this case, the seed word was variable, which is why this design came to life in this way. But the end result of this one was fantastic and I think a really beautiful uh, final product. Um, it's the cover is... Um, Splendor Luck. That's why I'm here. So the cast coated super shiny super glossy um and then what we wanted to do is really play around with the different textures um and different types of paper that you can have digital print in it doesn't have to be um you know the same paper or anything so it has a cast coated splendor lux as the cover the inside is free life vellum which is a 40 percent recycled paper so really nice and tactile and then the gsk translucent cover um which has all of the um all the designers that participated so it was around 800 something people all their names are on the cover but then the ones that are um in the darker white are the ones that are actually in the specific edition that you hold um so it was a really nice way to play around with three completely different ranges um but see how they complemented each other so nicely uh lots of shots of that so here's just a, a, an image that looks at the 23rd and the 24th of March just to show to illustrate the point that there's lots of different books open here and they all display different designs from different designers across those those spreads so that was what the code allowed us to do for this particular edition um just moving on then to 2022 this one we wanted to look at book finishing techniques and there's four volumes here held in a slip case um, we work with HP on this as well. So we had um, these outer sleeves that were created that have that housed the four books within and they had 
the name of the designer, the date and the sort of sequence number on the front of them. And um, inside you sort of pull out these beautiful books from within. They, if you assemble them all, come to spell 365 across them, across the front covers. And then we had various uh, yeah, book finish, book finishing binding methods employed for this. So um, we have an open, an open spine, we have a Swiss bound, we have a case bound book with the edges cut off sort of square. And we also have an otter bound book and diamond, uh, the book finishers who work, we work with also applied silver gilt edging to one of the books, uh, black digital print to another, and they also have a digital edge printing uh, machine that can print and match colors. So the red one in the far right corner is edge matched um, color and digitally printed, sort of wrapping the design around all surfaces. And there's some designs and in the inter there was four different printers that we work with for this one, actually. And each printer used a different ink on a different paper um, just to sort of move things around internally within each book. Um, we launched this at a fantastic venue that is sadly no longer um, available, which is the uh, parasol unit N one. There's me looking rather lonely, worrying if anyone's going to turn up and luckily they did. Um, so yeah, that and that was also a night of a tube strike and a COVID outbreak and all sorts of other things to contend with. So yeah, we just about survived that. And then the most recent year, not including this one, where we are right now, 2023, um, we wanted just to move the brief on a bit. So rather than um, sort of just sticking with the same idea of you take a date and you just interpret how you how you want, we gave everyone the word love to work with as well. We used 10 different red coloured sheets from Fedragoni's collection. And we this is Immitlin, a sort of wrap, a sort of present wrap that went around each copy. Which, by the way, there's new ranges out right now. So if you wanted to check that out, just uh, look on the Fedragoni website, just a little plug. <laughs> and then um, the cover, reached, so we had one set of foil dies for the cover made up and that was repeated across lots of different stocks. So there was lots of variability, even though this was a kind of very traditional production job, we still managed to get this sort of variation into the design through the way that the materials and the finishing techniques were used. Lots of gratuitous shots of it, floods of silver ink on certain color paper, and then at the launch event as well, sort of, yeah, um, Again, just uh, yeah, working out how best to display each edition based on the properties and the qualities it has. So we wanted to just group this in the signatures from the book of her colour. Um, and then just to kind of give a little bit more insight into, you know, you know, obviously people that are involved in the project, it's absolutely fantastic, you know, that you that you take part. And without you, we wouldn't be able to sort of put this book together. And then it's the sort of the fallout after that, like it receives so much uh, promotion in kind from blogs, from the traditional print press, from um, Instagram, social media, which we love this, you know, hashtag 365 and um, that's, seeing lots 365. That's, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just seeing all these images of, of, of your work out there in the world is, is really sort of affirming to the project. We sell copies obviously through counterprint and um, £30,000 has been raised so far, donated to various charities. And it's won loads of different awards ac across the years, which is fantastic um, accolade for the project. Now on to this year, obviously, which is really why we're here. Um, and we've worked with Effie Berman using their HP Indigo Press and SmartStream Designer, which is a software technology that allows you to sort of manipulate the designs that have been provided or any any creative work that you wanted to put into it, which you'll learn more about from speakers after me. I don't quite understand it still, but it's it's, it's amazing. Um, and what we wanted to do was just explore these variable capabilities. There's a thing called HP Mosaic, which allows certain transformations to happen to um, a design in, in any in any file that you maybe want to submit to an HP machine. Um, and really what we wanted to do was get everyone involved in the project to use it, we pretty quickly worked out that was going to be an even bigger project management feat than we were going to be ready to take on. So we decided to obviously brief everyone on what the parameters of this job were, and then we applied the HP Mosaic software R end. So in the end, if you go around this room afterwards and pick up a book and just check your design against a copy in a book, you'll find that no two designs are the same, that the colour palette that you were given has been shuffled um, through every edition, which is a, is a real um, feat of production and a, and a bit of a magic trick, to be honest. Um, 
this is a really boring image of a HP uh, swatch book, but I just wanted to show that the endochrome orange and the endochrome green are these very vivid colours that are not achievable with traditional lithographic printing, um, which is why we sort of went for those and then we based the entire palettes around those. So the orange book has endochrome, endochrome orange at its core and various four colour mixes on top of that to create the other colours and endochrome green similarly um, works like that as well, uh, which is why we've ended up with these palettes. And then just rewinding to like nine months ago the first proposal for this book looked quite different i just wanted to show how that how this came together um we were using mosaic to effectively to slide around this design of of um names of, of people who have submitted to the project historically just to kind of get a sense of how that would look and how that would work we love typography which you can obviously see in our work and we wanted to explore that here um but sort of through the evolution of the project we sort of decided maybe there are other ways of looking at this um we then added this jacket obviously very crude visual but the sort of square area is the jacket and then we said actually why don't we just you know put someone's name on it make that really big make it a crop of your name if you submit it to the project but then you know in the end we sort of take all that off make it really simple make it about this color celebrate the color your name's underneath um, on the front or back cover and we have the orange palette we have the green palette the jacket comes off with sort of digitally printed detail of, of um, you know who, who submitted the design in here and um, this just gives a sense of even the divider pages within the book have this variation variability happening so you've got april here in lots of different books open on that spread and you can see there's every every component changes from the background color to the type um on top of it and then your designs of course as well within that so yeah do have a look and you'll see the sort of magic trick happening before your eyes of the, the colors changing from one book to another and it's just been a huge you know huge feat of production in terms of making this work from what we understand we were just talking about it earlier hp has never produced a book to this scale we use mosaic quite often on covers of books but never to do the entire um inner of, of, of a publication like this so it's yeah it's unprecedented in, in scale of use of the software and i think it you know it really stands up as a, as a great piece of um print and design and also people wouldn't normally use um digital printing maybe to do such a long run it's three thousand books in total so 1500 of the green 1500 of the orange um, and for us, it was really important to uh, collaborate with HP on this edition because Fedger Groening has actually been in partnership with HP all the way since 2008. We were actually the first paper manufacturers to have HP certified papers. That means that you don't have to pre-treat it or anything. You can just um, you can buy the papers and they're ready to use on the machine, which obviously makes your life a lot easier. Um, and so to be able to collaborate with them on a project that um, is as you know, important for us and historical as Fedgrini 365 was amazing. Um, and, you know, I think digital printing is really fast and easy to use. You don't have as much preparation. So if you have to print even just one copy, it's great. But um, we wanted to show that you can be creative, not just with the print process, but also on the materials that you use. So we've printed on nine different um, papers, which can all be found in our Fedragoni Digital for HP Indigo printing swatch. Um, and it's a mix of some coated papers, uncoated papers, textured. Um, so to really give you a really nice tactile feel, um, depending on the kind of mood and vibe you want to have with your paper. Um, and um, we also added a little tip in, which Oswin will uh, talk about in a little bit, um, where um, for the for the leap year for the 29th of February, which is on Serial Ultra Black, which is the same paper we used for the very first edition, which is the blackest paper on the market. Um, and the colours really pop and it looks amazing. Um, so, yeah, it was a really labour of love, but we got there in the end. <laughs> and um, thank you for all the designers that took part and obviously our print partners. And um, we'll leave it now to um, Paul at FE Berman that will talk about um his experience i guess and in, in this in this project yes i've got to look into something yeah. okay <laughs> fine okay so i'm well up against it now aren't i and uh i haven't prepared anything and the reason for it i thought was everything's random everything's unique everything that's created is we're not sure what's going to happen with this particular project so i thought i'll just st stand here not prepare and just talk um and i don't know how that's going to go but um firstly uh, i'll just give a quick rundown of who we are and what we do and, and why we do it and 
why you have such a beautiful um, area of samples in FP Vermont. So we're, we're just near Tower Bridge. We've been going for about 60 years. We were very much pre-pressed before print in the old days. So I started, believe it or not, as an apprentice at FE Berman in 1982, a little lad going to London College of uh, Print once a week and dealing with film, chemicals, brushes, scalpels, masking. So we had a we had we had a really good history of knowing about layers and then about moving things around and and getting things wrong sometimes, which could create really interesting ideas. Um, 25 years ago, we re realized that PDFs were coming along and, you know, technology was coming along. And that was the end of us to a degree. So we took on one of the very first HP presses. Everyone's calling it HP, but I'm going to have to do Indigo a favor here because the Indigo is a company that manufactures the HP Indigo presses, which this is all produced on. Uh, Israeli based company. Um, if you ever wanted to speak to the main man there and you sent a message, something about his HP press, he will come back to you in seconds and say, don't you mean the Indigo HP press? So it's an Indigo press uh, manufactured in Israel. And we picked one up about 25 years ago, the first in London. It was terrible. You could actually print um, something unique every time, but the quality was poor, but it was the first on the market. It was very offset looking, so it looked very, very natural. And um, it's, it's helped us hugely because what it's enabled us to do is do very short runs and very unique projects. And then what we found ourselves doing is basically, we, I think we have two areas that we love as a, as, as a company, um, is uniqueness, which is this, every sheet different, because we can print every sheet different because the presses allow you to print everything different. Problem is you've got to get designers to create something different every time. So that was always a problem and creating beautiful tactile things. So paper is really important. Um, just just the visual appearance of stuff. And um, yeah, so we want to create beautiful tactile stuff that gets the message across. You're going to go to the event. You're going to go to the party. You're you'll just want to interact with that piece of print or we find it, I find it really annoying that sometimes jobs are coming off the press and there's a thousand sheets all looking the same. It really, really bugs me because it doesn't have to look the same. Um, and technology's changed and software like Mosaic and Collage and, and Spark, which is enabling uh, us all to be able to create something different every time, hence what you're seeing around you. What, what I find fascinating, I was asking a couple of people how long it took to create their, their numbers and their artwork and some took two hours some took two days and some took two weeks and um it took us or i think it took us like a few hours to create uh how many uh 2999 of them so i'm not sure why it takes you guys so long to create one but anyway so but uh lucky enough we uh, we engage with all you creative people it was a bit of a learning curve for a printer to understand creativity because the art of the project and the mo more painful you guys are you creatives are the end result is so much better so a project like this is which is really in theory an absolute nightmare to produce is the best projects because you get more out of them uh, i realized when I was when the Tate Modern opened for the first time and you've got you know me from SE1 Bermondsey looking in the Tate Modern and having no idea what's going on you know thinking is this art and I walked into a room yeah. and there was decorating uh, ladders a board across paint and some dust sheets and I'm thinking why have they not closed this area off right and then I realized it was the exhibition so it's, so that triggered me into starting to understand art a lot more and um I just I just find it incredible that we we are so fortunate being in the middle of London and have creatives coming into us and asking us to do projects. And for some reason, we want to take the challenge on every time. I don't know why, because often it's hard work and most of the time it might not even be profitable. But we're finding ourselves in the middle of London. Open doors to anyone, especially students. We have a lot of students coming in just wanting to create uniqueness. And this project is the hardest project and the biggest project we've ever created for uniqueness and uh, it has been very challenging the papers are incredible so you know it's like can we use two papers was the question i think at the beginning and once you say that uh, how many papers did we use ten. more than two ten so it just kept evolving and tm being uh you know 
challenging and wanting to change things around all the time. It was a question of, uh, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? I don't really think we knew where we were going with this. Would that be fair? <laughs> you might, yeah. We, we we didn't. So, And I don't know what part we took in this, because I think it's a really interesting project because we've all merged together. And no one, I don't think anyone can put their hand up and say, I created this project. I think we all did, didn't we? Uh, so... Really, the bottom line is, is we are a company in the middle of town uh, with a big open door to students and ev everyone trying to create uniqueness. And uh, I think uh, that's 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 the advantage we've got. And 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 that's pretty much us, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all right? Thanks for your help. And <laughs> just torturous a task. <laughs> um, and now, um, like I said before, um, whereas the uh, most of the book was changed, the color shuffling was done thanks to the HP software um, smart stream, designer smart stream and mosaic. The 29th of February was done with HP Spark, which was a software created in spare time. I watch TV in my spare time, but Oswin decide, uh, decides to design software. And so he's going to tell us a little bit more about um, about his his software and how he did it and uh, his design. Apologies, technical issues. There you go. Hi, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, I'm Oswin Tickler. I'm a designer and educator. So I, I teach a lot. I'm mainly based in the University of the Arts London, down at London College of Communication. I teach across publishing, design, and increasingly into kind of illustration and visual media. Um, yeah, and I'm going to kind of explain a little bit about how kind of um, I ended up, I guess, working in this way and producing this piece in particular for um, Fedragoni 366. Um, so in terms of kind of my own practice, it's slightly confusing. I've only kind of begun to explore it much more over the last few years. Um, before that, I was doing much more just work that anyone will pay me for. Now it's much more work I want to be doing. Um, and really I describe it as kind of exploring the space between things. So it's the idea of kind of order and chaos, which you may or may not see in my work. I don't know, or perhaps in my whole demeanor, um, but kind of that relationship between design and education as well, this kind of almost non-binary um, way of looking at the world. So there are no hard edges between things. Um, but in terms of uh, the origins of this kind of variable way of uh, working, um, I was asked in my role as a designer, but also teaching down at London College of Communication to um, create a print publication exploring uh, algorithms. So students had produced a body of work on algorithms. They wanted a publication to uh, celebrate this. Um, and so this was just before the pandemic, a few months beforehand, and I wanted to work out a way that I could visualize algorithms in in some way in the design and not simply draw stuff that kind of looks like bits of computers um, because that just seemed a bit naff. Uh, I didn't know how to go about this. Um, I investigated some of the kind of technology and came across uh, HP Mosaic um, and what else did they have? HP Collage and other bits of software, but conceptually it didn't quite scratch the itch for me. Um, and so I decided to foolishly look into creative coding, signed up to a short evening class on that after kind of a couple of hours. I thought theoretically it's possible, but I don't know that I'm quite able to use code in such a way that I, I kind of like what I'm actually producing. So hundreds of hours later, a lot of kind of uh, all nighters just spent working away at coding, exploring different things. I created um, these covers, these are just the front covers that explore different aspects of uh, creative coding and just seeing what it can do um, in a kind of being exported for print. Usually creative coding is exported only for screen use, websites, uh, animations, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so that was that. And this is kind of at the time when exploring whether or not this would actually print is when um, I went and saw Paul and indeed Roger uh, at FE Berman and, and they were kind of keen to work with uh, me on this and to test any of the kind of files I was creating. So um, the kind of relationships 
between everyone in this publication in Federagoni 366. Um, some of them kind of started earlier than that, or certainly my relationship with different parts of it started earlier than that. Pandemic happened, so the exhibition this was going with didn't happen, so they were printed, didn't really get released, um, and so kind of in some ways that was kind of it. However, six months later, um, Paul had put uh, Guy Beebe, who we'll hear from next, uh, in touch with me, and I'm not quite sure what he told Guy, but there's, a, there's someone exploring different ways of creating um, variable artwork. So I had a meeting with Guy and um, an HP Indigo developer, Amir, and I kind of did a big presentation. This is what we can do and all this stuff. And we've started producing this software based on what you're doing. Um, can you help us develop it, essentially, and test it? And I think even in that first meeting, I said, I'm not sure I'm the right person for the job. Um, so, but here we are. So obviously I kind of stuck at it. Um, and as they were building the software and kind of beginning to um, communicate it to the wider world, um, that's when Paul and I went and saw Ambra uh, at Fedragoni, and we started producing some materials um, using different uh, Fedragoni um, paper stock and had a kind of launch for it. And this is it's going to animate. So this is one of the pieces that was hanging on their kind of wall system. Quite simple in some ways, but the amount of time people spent kind of working out which one was their favourite, which one they liked, the kind of colour combinations or the forms of it. Um, it was amazing the kind of increased engagement with it. And I've been doing various kind of projects with this, and some of them have been uh, more commercial, some of them have been more kind of self-initiated. Um, again, the connection comes through uh, F.E. Berman. Uh, they had printed um, the BAFTA kind of uh, programs for their various awards over a number of years. Um, and he had told them about this new technology um, and about me and my kind of capabilities in that area. And we worked together to produce um, their brochures across their film awards and their TV games and TV craft awards for this last year. Um, and that went down kind of with great success, really. Apparently, they even announced it at the beginning of the film awards um, to the audience, to kind of film stars and stuff. And there's an audible ooh from everyone. And I've got I've not included them, uh, but I've got photos of people like Colin Farrell or Adrian Lester with kind of uh, the brochures as well. But also, fantastically, um, there were no copies left essentially after the event sometimes they get left with all of the copies so people obviously cherish them that little bit more took them home because they were unique which is fantastic and environmentally that's great as well and so this kind of brings us to the origins of this the final piece looks nothing like this but um i was kind of exploring lots of different ways of working with code because as I was kind of given carte blanche, really, except for it's going on black, it's got to be in white and green, um, and it needs to somehow link to number 29, I kind of thought I'd, I'd push my understanding of what I could do with code. And that started with actually drawing with code, so allowing it to kind of create two different shapes, one with 20 points, one with nine points, and seeing what it came up with. Weirdly, we've got a kind of bowing dog in the second one on the top row there. Um, and I didn't really like that. I kind of conceptually thought perhaps this is going somewhere. Um, so then looked at kind of refining that and starting to kind of draw uh, with lines and with Bezier curves to the numbers 29 and overlaying that with the shapes. Still wasn't happy. Carried on with the Beziers. Kind of, there might be something in it. It wasn't quite doing it for me. Um, and hopefully you'll agree I've made the right choice. Uh, when you see the final things. And this is just, oh, let's set these going. And this is just kind of uh, some of essentially the previews I was looking at on screen when I was creating it. So I wasn't particularly worried about whether I liked any of them or not. It was more about are most of the forms legible as 29s? Do they feel quite different? Do they take on different personalities, uh, et cetera? 
And there was also various uh, technical problems I had to overcome. And again, Roger has been fantastic in helping with that, um, where the colours were knocking out uh, the white behind it. And I knew that would be a problem on black paper. So we found a way of overcoming that, which is great. Uh, and then TM have kindly put together this video. So I'm just going to. Does have sound, but you can just hum in your head. That's fine. We'll leave it. We won't risk it. This is all at F environments. We were um, yeah. filming the the process as we usually like to do. Just to um, it's great for social media content. People tend to love to see um, actually being at the printers. Um, I love it going in so. Um, I, I love it as well because I, I didn't quite know how it was going to print. It was a bit of a leap into the unknown in terms of its how it reacts with uh, the paper, particularly the green on those areas where it's not directly onto the white ink. Um, but it's fantastic. And I love seeing, again, the variableness of it makes even us designers who have designed it surprised and kind of smile when we're checking it on press, which is quite unusual. Um, and then I will leave you with that. So that is something that Guy Beebe, I'm going to pass to him. So it's it's not my software. This is very much HP Indigo software built on uh, kind of principles using open source creative coding that I was looking at. So I do do workshops with students and agencies where we can explore the open source part of it, but you have to run it through a couple of different changes to make it work better in a print environment. But yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and that seems like a good transition um, to go to our last speaker, which is Guy Beebe from HP, which is, he is going to connect via team. So I'll just stop sharing over here. Okie dokie. Sorry, I have a thousand tabs open. There we go. Hi, Guy. There you are. Now you can hear me, I hope. Yes. <laughs> ah, perfect, perfect. So I'll share my screen. Uh, let me know if you can actually see it. Uh, my desktop, right? <laughs> yep. OK. And now you should be able to see the presentation. Yes. Yeah, perfect. So uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> really, it's a, I, I'm I'm so bummed out that I can't actually be there in person to to see you guys and and uh, enjoy the the evening with you and you know and geek out about print with uh with all of these fantastic people you know I've worked with with Paul and Oswin and Roger and and, and Danny and you Ambra uh, about uh, on this project and it's, it's been amazing and you know seeing the actual live print is, is amazing. I haven't really felt it yet, but uh, I, I hope to soon. Um, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Guy. I'm, I'm super excited to be here, really uh, excited. And I really want to show you, I mean, you know, Oswin talked about the, the software that, that he actually developed. We kind of took his idea and then we kind of maybe elaborated it a little bit to make it more accessible. Uh, to uh, new designers, but also add uh, some more capabilities for logic, etc. Um, I also want to kind of tell you why we do this, why HP Indigo, which develops a printing press, a digital printing press with amazing capabilities, why do we invest so much time in creative uh, capabilities? Why do we invest in our software? Uh, and I, I usually start with this painting. Uh, this is a painting by Eduard Manet from 1882. Um, and if you look at this beautiful painting, you see something very interesting that hasn't really changed in the past 150 years. If you look closely, you'll see that there are two glass bottles that have a label on them and a logo, which means that they were mass produced in some sort of way. Um, uh, and, you know, people could actually go and buy them. And it's not really different than what we see today in, in the stores, right? Um, now, something really crucial did change in these 150 years uh, since uh, we, we started this, and it's actually our attention span. Our attention span is decreasing, and we can see that 
we have less time to engage with our products if we go to the to the shelves we see uh, less and less people who are kind of trying to to find the right product for them because you don't have an enough time to engage with them now when researchers were were asked why um, we are losing the attention span the answer was that because we are more and more online we have so much things going on we lo lose attention span and I just want to show you this uh, graph, and I'm sorry, this is the only graph you'll see here, I promise. Um, it's a very simple question. Where do, you f where do you feel more like yourself, when you're online or when you're offline? And this is very interesting because you see that 75% of boomers, they feel more like themselves when they're offline. But the trends have changed, and Gen Zs today feel more like themselves when they are online. They feel more respected. They have uh, a lot more friends, a lot uh, more uh, engaging things to do. But the most amazing thing is that boomers and Gen Zs may speak English, but they do not speak the same language. Now, the actual sp spending power, the dollars, is shifting from the boomers towards the Gen Zs. And brands understand that in order to sell to these uh, new uh, generations, they also need to change their language. They need to sell differently. They need to engage them differently. They have different needs altogether. And this is where brands feel the problems. This is not something that HP invented. This is something that called the SADS acronym. Uh, and it stands for saturation, anxiety, distrust, and scrutiny. And our capabilities, the software and the hardware can actually bridge those problems. So in little, really a teaser, I will explain what each of these is. So saturation is, of, is of course, we are bombarded with all of these marketing messages um, and we have less time to engage. If I'll ask you, what is the last commercial you saw on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok? Most of you will not remember it. Uh, and it's because we skip it. We know how to filter it out. But to be honest, if you take your carton of milk or your cornflakes box, you have to engage with it, whether you want it or not. So our printing capabilities can bridge this gap and the product turns into the message. The second thing is solastalgia or anxiety. And this means because we are more and more and more online, we know everything that is happening, right? We know about what is happening here in Israel. We know what happens in LGBTQ rights, in women's rights, in Black Lives Matter. We know everything and we expect our brands to stand with us to some extent uh, and this is how we can help because we have all of these flexibility we can change the entire production line within minutes to kind of overcome every issue that turns out in the world the third thing is distrust we believe less we believe less the governments we believe less the uh, the newspapers and media and actually we believe less the brands. And this is why brands invest a lot of money in putting security solutions, in brand protection, uh, to kind of put the right message either on the package or uh, as the media. And to be completely honest, I lied to you a bit as well, because everything that you see on the sides is not painted by Edouard Manet. This was added with AI. So now it's really easy to lie to us. And this is why we need to kind of put uh, this message out there. And the last thing is scrutiny. And scrutiny is actually the return on investment, or what we call the ROI. Uh, because when you put a dollar out there, you want to see almost an immediate ROI. And with our set of capabilities, you can actually put messaging on your product and sell more, and maybe even in a, in a higher price, without changing the supply chain and the production line of this product. So what are the tools that we have? We have a very simple tool called uh, personalization, right? So we can take any database, any product, and then create millions of different iterations, right? We did this with Nutella. We did this with Coca-Cola with the names campaign. But look at this amazing uh, example. This is a Mermite jar. And of, co of course, you are all aware of Mermite. I'm sorry, I'm not a big fan, but uh, I hope you understand. 
But just look at this. Uh, a jar of mermite in the store costs 360 pounds. But once you just change the label on it, you change it to a name, you can sell it for 12 pounds. This is immediate ROI, right? The brand did not change anything and could charge more for the same product. And we are seeing with, uh, you know, a lot of surveys that we did with uh, work with the World Advertising Research Center that people are willing to pay more for these products. And this is why brands invest in, in these things. Another set of tools that we have is uh, mass customization. And this is what Oswin also talked about, right? We have Mosaic and Collage and Spark and Edge and uh, uh, Spine. We have a lot of tools to kind of change the designs forever and you can fit it uh, as you need and create millions of different iterations in a very easy manner. And you'll see a lot of examples uh, in the coming slides. But these are just the software. Of course, we also have the hardware. So let's imagine that this is an analog printer. Of course, it's an amazing piece of machinery, right? It's capable, durable, but it's not very agile. And this is what Paul mentioned about just doing, right? Your, like your home printing uh, uh, printer, but in larger scale. So. HP Indigo is like a speedboat. You can take it wherever you want, long runs or short runs, change the colors, change the languages, print only on, on what you need, print on demand. Anything that you want, the HP Indigo press can do. The second thing Paul also mentioned is uniqueness. So this is a, a mold uh, for analog printer. I don't know if you know the name of this thing, but it's actually called a cliche. The word cliche comes from this because once you build the mold, you're printing it over and over again, making it a cliche. But the HP Indigo digital press is like Picasso painting with light because every second Picasso moves his arm, it's a unique piece of art, right? It will never be repeated. And we can promise you that every paper that comes out of the HP Indigo digital press is unique. It can be numbered. It can be uh, um, one of a kind. Again, only if you want it to. Then if you take all of these things together and, and put them kind of like all of the set of capabilities, it gives you a, a, a unique um, a fingerprint on every product. And then if you look at the beer bottles that we saw earlier in Eduardo Manez uh, example, there is no reason in the world why they can't look like this. And this is a real campaign uh, that we created one in a billion uh, with Heineken a billion different labels. Each one of them is unique and numbered. And you can see the power of these capabilities. But of course, you know, this is 1 billion different labels. We can also print 10, 20, 2000 books, anything that you want. Now, let me show you a little bit about the tools themselves. What is Mosaic? You heard a lot about it. So let's kind of, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, just touch what these are. So. Uh, this example is uh, a campaign uh, that was done with Kellogg's uh, for their 100th uh, birthday anniversary. Uh, and they decided to celebrate their brand. So they created this beautiful pattern with their history, all of the designs that were done for Kellogg's throughout the years. Then they put it in HP Mosaic. And HP Mosaic allows you to take simply uh, four parameters, zoom, rotation, transposition and color shuffling. And then with these four parameters, you can set it uh, as much as you want and you can create millions of different iterations. So imagine that with this design, every box can be forever different and you don't need to do a lot. You simply give it to the software and you have the output ready to print. So you can see the images are changing, the numbers are changing, the backgrounds are changing and you can be as flexible as you want. But you are not limited to the amount of designs. You can put as many patterns as you want. Uh, and also, if you want, also just play with the, with the parameters. So in this case, we actually have a lot of shirts, a lot of hair, a lot of facial hair, skin tones, glasses, etc. But we didn't put any parameter. So we simply told the software, select one shirt and bring it to a fixed position. Select one hair and bring it to a fixed position. So in a click of a button, you have endless amount of characters and you can celebrate Pride Month. 
this is a local brewery in Israel that only created 6,000 different beer labels. Each one is unique. Each one is forever different. And they can even connect it to an e-commerce platform. So you can go online and you can post your pictures or create yourself on the beer bottle and then uh, share it on social media. Another example that I'm sure uh, Effie Berman knows really well uh, because they help us actually to create this uh, occasion and, and you'll see this. This is the bottles of Smirnoff and you can see everything here is different. The backgrounds, the hats, the bodies, the faces. Uh, this was done with uh, the Yarza twins who designed this beautiful campaign and it was printed uh, some of it on Effie Berman's and some of it in other uh, presses. But you can see here that once you design this beautiful thing, and let's say that tomorrow you want to do the exact same thing for Halloween or for Christmas, you don't need to redesign everything. Simply change the palette of colors because we have this color shuffling mechanism, and you can have the exact same design for any occasion you want. You can see the designers here are actually proofing the job on the press, so you, you, you're not also limited to the amount of, of time you can change things. This is digital. Simply change it, upload it to the press and print it. Now, once you have the design, you can even print it on anything that HP allows you to print on. So here we printed it on huge corrugated boxes that once you stack them, you can see those beautiful patterns. We printed singular boxes. We printed on posters, on huge corrugated figures, on the tables. With HP Latex, we printed on the floors. Uh, we wrapped chairs with it. We, we created coupons and, and anything that you can imagine. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, the last um, uh, of, of, the, um, of the Smirnoff. Just one question, Amber, do we still have time? Can I continue a little bit more? We're a bit running over time, but I think um, I think yes. Yeah, those uh, I'll just do it really, really swiftly because I want to kind of touch what Oswin um, uh, talked about, about HP Spark. But I want to kind of give, um, I kind of encapsulate it to what the capabilities are. So as, H as Oswin said, we have HP Spark that was developed by uh, Oswin. We got the initial idea of generative art and creative coding from Oswin, but you can Today, with HP Spark, do so much more. You can create your own security solution, add logic, create interactive designs, add artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and if I kind of give an example, then of course, Oswin showed this. But if you look at both uh, pages, you see on the right side, Oswin's work with HP Spark, and you can see the generative art part of it, right? The numbers are changing. On the left side, this is HP Mosaic with color shuffling. So you can see the same design with color shuffle, but it actually shows the variety and capabilities of, of these beautiful tools. Uh, for example, this is another um, creative uh, generative art. We created these uh, lines only through code. So you can see we printed them on these beer bottles uh, and on, on these flexible packaging. But the beautiful thing about uh, what Oswin is doing is that we can actually take the code and we can translate it into UI. So once you have the code, we will show you in HP Spark, kind of like a UI that change all the variables. So you can change the number of lines, the numbers of, of uh, the alpha of the uh, circle, the radius of it, if you want a shadow or not, the color uh, capabilities. And you can kind of take this and adapt it without knowing how to change the code. Uh, I'll skip this Toblerone uh, example. It just shows the amount of things we've done for Toblerone. You know, they wanted different colorations, but also a lot of different variability, like avoiding themes, etc. We can change the supply chain for real. Today, we are working with uh, an Israeli company called Astria, and you can add uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. This is Noga Erez, a very, a very famous uh, singer in Israel. I can train her face, and then I can use her face on whatever I want. I did this uh, with myself as the um, um, Edouard Manet painting we saw earlier. But today, we, you can actually take this, print posters, uh, engage your audiences, print whatever you need, 
we pitched this for her for she where you can celebrate the successful women in your life uh your mother your daughter your sisters and really uh, uh create something uh, amazing uh and one sorry one last example is uh we have the ability of connecting all of these ai capabilities together so you can take a design uh, this is something that was created with Midjourney, uh, and with Midjourney, I can I can scale it up for print, and with Photoshop, I can actually take the different elements and create uh, layers from them. Then I can use them in in our tool to generate endless amount of variations. And again, with a simple trick, you can have as many different variables as you want. The the boats will shift forever, the river will change forever, and Actually, this campaign from the mid-journey image to the printed uh, product took two hours, which is kind of amazing uh, with our set of capabilities today. Um, do I have one, uh, one more uh, example? Time? OK. Uh, so as Oswin said, this, is, this creative coding is open source, uh, and you can actually take whatever you want. You have a lot of, of kind of um, um, blogs and, and uh, communities that show creative coding. You can see these beautiful designs that were created by a designer. You can shuffle them forever, but they actually give you the code. So you can take this code, put it in HP Spark, and you can see that we translate the UI for you. So you see the colors uh, that you can actually change the palette of colors here. And once I put it in our software, you can change her dress forever. Right now, of course, this was written by a designer similar to what Oswin is doing. But today you can actually go to ChatGPT or a Bard or uh, Anthropic, whatever. You can ask it to write a P5JS script for you. For example, here I wrote a, you know, a pattern with 40 different shapes and colors, etc. It actually writes the P5JS script for you that you know you can actually then change maybe with what Oswin will teach you. Uh, and then once you put it in, a, in our software in, in uh, Smart Stream Designer with HP Spark, you can then take the code that ChatGPT wrote and change this uh, pattern of this box forever and ever and ever. Uh, so it was a, a nutshell. I'm sorry I took much of your time, uh, but thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to work on this project and, and what the guys have done is incredible. Um, and I'd love to engage with you. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for uh, for your help in this project as well. It, I think it's safe to say it couldn't have been done without you uh, and the input you gave us and also the help to reel us in because we had all these crazy ideas and you uh, helped us to have a vision and, uh, and complete it. Um, we're a bit over time, but if anybody has any questions to any of the speakers, because yes, in the back. Why do you think personalization is so for orders so with unique product is so popular? Is it you know because it makes people feel more sick, or is it sort of the you know humor of it, or you know like Marmite was kind of this kind of funny side to it? You know, a lot of those products are FMG products as well. They're not you know they might be something you might keep up with, but they're not notoriously those kind of products. So what, what's the what's the problem? Did you hear that guy? No, sorry, I, I didn't say. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, why do you think personalization is um, so captivating and why people tend to to keep the items or to, to um, you know, engage with it more than something that's not personalized? Well, it, we actually, as I mentioned, we, we did a lot of work with WORK, uh, the World Advertising Research Center, and we saw that people, especially Gen Zs and millennials, really love to interact with their products. They want to be unique. They want to take a picture of it. They want it to speak to them. And again, they're willing to pay more. I think we are seeing a different change in, in, in personalization. I think people are looking uh, for the brand to speak their language, uh, to kind of appeal to what they or you know, they want to, to, to be seen as. And again, we are seeing more and more of these things where you know, it's not just uh, for the uh, kind of the consumer to take the product that he wants, but also for the brand to convey what they want to convey to the consumer. So we, we did a lot of work with uh, 
kind of helping elephants, helping rhinos around the world. So every bottle you buy, you donate money uh, to, to a kind of a cause or things like that. Um, so I don't know if it answered the question, but we do uh, see uh, a lot of need, uh, more and more need in, in personalization. And the fact that we can actually do this and, you know, we, with the AI uh, capability, we were trained to kind of get things as, as an, an immediate and we are fast kind of, um, uh, we know to adapt to new technology. Uh, so we want more and more uh, uniqueness and, and uh, diversity. I think as well, what we saw um, with Fed Granny 365, for some editions where we personalized the covers, it just, it for the person receiving it, that's, no one else is going to have that cover, especially um, with Fed Granny 365, where it will have, you know, the date you designed or something like that. Um, whereas, you know, with Coca-Cola, maybe there are a lot of Annas. There aren't a lot of Ambers. I never found a Coca-Cola bottle with my name on it, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um but, uh, you know, so you're more likely to keep that because no one else is going to have that copy that is absolutely unique to you. It has your name on it, it has your design. Um, and I think it's just a bit special. And if one day, I don't know, you donate it to a charity shop, then whoever picks that up, they're only going to have that one design and that's not going to be replicated um, from anyone else. So um, we did have a bit of personalization in this edition where um, we personalized the jacket. So it will have um, one of the designer's names and their date on there. And then on the inside, um, just to show the um, color um, shuffling technology, um, they'll have a design that has um, the color shuffling in, to show you different examples of what that looks like. A lot easier for our paper consultants to carry this sheet around instead of a massive personalized book. I hope they appreciate the thought this year. <laughs> because we had some complaints in previous years. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, any other questions by anyone online? Yes. Oh. The creative cloud um, software. And then also are they specific only to, with the output, are they only for um, HP printers and, and RIPs connected to that, or can it be used by um, other printers that, that you know, say may not have a mm -hmm. or HP. Guy, did you hear that? Well, I, I think so. I, 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 I think I understood the gist of it. Uh, the question was if if uh, you can pr you can use the software to print on other printers as well. That that was the question basically, right? And um, if so the plugin can only be used um, with uh, Illustrator, or if it can be with other um, yeah. So, so the two questions. The first one is uh, we have this plugin for both Illustrator and InDesign, so you can use uh, both. Um, the question about the HP uh, uh, digital presses, yes, you can you can only use them with HP digital presses. Uh, and actually, it's it's a lot more than that because you know I showed you the kind of the design capabilities that you can install on your local computer and kind of use. But in order to generate these millions of different variations or these 3000 books, you need horsepower. And for that, you need guys like F.E. Berman that has the capabilities of taking this uh, smart stream designer, but on a server scale. And so this is how we kind of adapt it to the HP uh, digital presses. So once you have the design, you can pack it. We have a package similar to what you have in Adobe. We only call it uh, an HPD file. You can pack this, send it to your printer, to Effie Berman, to Paul, to Roger, and they will create the, the files for you for print. Are those plugins available? What would you have to contact you? I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Uh, I just want to get these. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, please, please feel free to contact us, and then we'll, uh, we'll be glad to send you the installer. Any other questions or anyone online? Nope. Cool. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I wanted to just take a moment to thank um, not only our current print partners, but our past print partners as well. Like I said, it's been our seventh uh, edition, so um, it's uh, it's always really exciting to uh, work with uh, different people and especially all the different designers. We haven't calculated exactly how many um, you know unique people have. Uh, taking part in uh, Federal 365 in the last um, seven years, but it's 
more than 2000, I think we tried to do quick maths um, and to be able to engage with so many um, people in the community as well is is, is amazing. Um, we share the designs for this for the current year on social media every day. So if you want to follow Fedogranny365 on Instagram and Twitter slash X, however you want to call it, <laughs> um, we post on there every day. Um, and uh, if you wanted to have a better look at the archive as well, um, there's a website called fedogranny365.com where you'll be able to see all the previous editions and also what papers were used um, that link directly to our um, the Fedogranny website, paper.fedogranny.com. Um, so yeah, give us a follow, give us a like, and thank you so much all for coming here. And uh, for the people that are in London and want to see the exhibition, uh, we have the orange book and the green book. So right now there are 732 artworks displayed, but actually with all the books that were printed, over two million unique uh, artworks have been created. So um, I hope you enjoy. And the charity that we are supporting this year is um, uh, Save the Children. So if you want to buy any copies as well, we have some here or online with counterprints. So thank you all so much for coming and for tuning in. <laughs> thank you so much. This It looks amazing. Again, sorry I can't be there with you. No, thank you. And thank you to all our speakers. So, yes, thank you. I'll tune in now. Goodbye. <laughs>